Robots. Helpful or threatening? Cute or scary? Whether we like it or not, these machines are becoming more commonplace and fundamental to the way we live our lives. Let's chat. Whoops, can you say that again? In this series, the FT will take a closer look at the roles that robots may play in our homes, in the workplace and the world around us. We'll show how far this technology is advancing and what the coming robot revolution means for humanity. Here we go. Auto driving. So at this point, the car is driving itself. Okay. Oh, look, there's another Google car. Get that <laughs> It is no longer a question of if, but when self-driving cars become a fixture of our roads. Some vehicles, like this Google self-driving car prototype, have already notched up more than a million miles on public roads, while other vehicles, like Tesla's Model S, let regular drivers get a taste of hands-free driving on things like the freeway. But as we'll see, it could be a long and winding road before driverless cars become a regular sight on our roads. Cars are able to guide themselves down the road thanks to several sensors attached to the outside of the vehicle and a huge quantity of processing power inside that allows it to learn about obstacles and respond to unexpected events. One manufacturer of that computing horsepower is NVIDIA, whose Drive PX2 combines the equivalent of 150 MacBook Pro computers into a single shoebox-sized circuit board. We're now at the point where artificial intelligence is able to achieve superhuman levels of perception and we can create cars that are much, much safer than those driven by humans. It doesn't take long to spot a Google self-driving car in Mountain View. Here, on the streets around its Silicon Valley headquarters, Google has a fleet of vehicles constantly driving around, gaining real-world experience. For now, though, only certified Google engineers can sit behind the wheel while the company perfects its technology. Sebastian Thrun, who co-founded Google's self-driving car project, is in no doubt of the safety benefits this technology can bring in the coming years. When a human makes a mistake, hopefully he or she learns from it and never makes the same mistake again. By and large, nobody else can learn anything. We all have to make the same mistakes. When a self-driving car makes a mistake, that car learns from it, and so do all the other cars, including all the future unborn cars. That means AI, self-driving cars, learn faster than people can learn. So it's just a matter of time until they're infinitely safer than people are. Silicon Valley has become a center for autonomous car research in the last couple of years, with many major automakers joining local companies like Google here to develop new technologies. Many of them have come here to Moffett Field to pilot their driverless cars and see what it's like when you take the human or even the wheel outside of the vehicle. How autonomous driving technology moves from the test strip here to the real highway is a matter of intense debate in Silicon Valley, with some companies aiming for full autonomy, while others looking for a more limited approach that would still require a driver behind the wheel. Google has long been the leading proponent of full autonomy, described as level four by the American Highways Regulator. Google has even designed prototype vehicles that remove the steering wheel and pedals altogether fundamentally comes down to safety. That when we think about somebody using this technology and it uh, being on the road, um, you know, and telling that person that they can sit back in the seat and relax and read a book and whatever else, it's not really fair uh, to also say, but you have to be ready to jump in uh, and supervise the car at a moment's notice. But some automakers, such as Toyota and GM, are taking a more incremental approach, adding what are called active safety technologies to cars every year. Proponents of this approach believe that it will take too long to make full autonomy work reliably everywhere. Instead, car companies are aiming for what regulators class as level three, or limited self-driving. This allows drivers to let go of the wheel and take their eyes off the road in many situations, such as a motorway. But if something unusual happens, such as a sudden snow flurry, the human driver would have to take over. Some of the players in the industry really believe that you have to make a direct jump to level four series autonomy. And what that means is really the chauffeur mode, where you tell the car where to go, and the car takes full control and just you know, does the whole job. The difficulty with that is that it's going to take a while until we get there, and in the meantime, we can't save lives. We actually have a hybrid approach where we believe in parallel autonomy, which we call the guardian angel mode, as well as series autonomy, which is the chauffeur mode. And in the parallel mode, the driver is in control of the car all of the time, and the guardian angel just intervenes 
to prevent the accident that might occur. Our approach is actually to pursue both of them. While it is easy to imagine a world where getting from A to B is as simple as hailing a driverless Uber, robot drivers will have to coexist with those erratic humans on the roads for many years to come. Making sure the two can coexist safely is one of the biggest challenges facing technologists today, whether that's inside or outside the car. A little over a year ago, we were testing in Mountain View and an example of the crazy things that we see. So the car comes around a corner and it's faced with this uh, woman in an electric wheelchair chasing a duck in the road. And the, you know, basically they, they run around in a figure eight in front of the car and then eventually get out of the way. And if I'd asked you the top 10 things or even the top thousand things that the car would have to do well on the road, probably would never have come to mind. One big hurdle to reaching level four full autonomy is training computers to respond to every potential eventuality on the roads, including distracted human drivers. But computers can make mistakes too. In February, Google was forced to make changes to its algorithms after one of its cars drove into a bus in Mountain View. It was the first time a Google self-driving vehicle had caused an accident. The robot car had incorrectly assumed that the bus driver would slow down to make room for it. We're not happy that we bumped into the side of the bus and it ended up being a subtly complex uh, interaction that led to this where we were testing uh, a new behavior which allows our car to share a lane with another driver. Um, this is something that people do on a daily basis but our cars hadn't done before and it, it's kind of subtle. And in this case, there was really a, a, a difference in assumption, so our car assumed the bus didn't have room to fit past, so the bus driver assumed that he did, and we behaved based on our assumption, and you know, it turned out he was right. There was enough room if our car hadn't moved that he could have squeezed past. Toyota argues that in certain unusual situations, human drivers would still do a better job at responding than machines. I always use the example of the box that falls off the truck. Suddenly there's this thing that's rolling across the ground and, uh, you know, uh, on the road in front of you is the car smart enough to handle it completely on its own? Now, people aren't very good at doing it either, but our tolerance to a machine making a mistake is much, much lower than it is to a human being making a mistake. As a result, we need cars right now that at least can switch modes back and forth between a mode where you say, I know that from now till the end of the trip, things are going to be safe enough that I can trust the autonomy to take over 100% of the time. And so I go ahead and turn on that, that mode. In a case where I'm not quite so sure, I would choose a different mode. Handling that transition between driving modes is a key area of research for Toyota's Silicon Valley R&D team. So using sound tends to work, and of course you can use sounds that are soft at the beginning and get louder if the person doesn't uh, respond to it. There are techniques where you shake the seat or you shake the uh, steering wheel that also work uh, too to let the person know that there's something wrong and that they should pay attention. Um, the difficulty is really if they're asleep, what are we going to do if they're, you know, so tired that it's difficult to rouse them? And of course, the answer in that case is somehow pull the car off to the side of the road in a safe way. However, Google argues that sharing the driving responsibility between human and machine will be more dangerous. We did a lot of studies on test tracks uh, to understand how much forewarning you'd have to give someone uh, so they could be ready to take over. And you know, it turns out to be several seconds is what you need uh, to kind of make sure someone's going to be there. But that's for a person who's kind of in the seat and awake and alert. You could imagine if this is someone who is really you know, into the movie they're watching or asleep, the time to really get the whole situational awareness of what's happening on the road around you is, is you know, potentially much longer. As well as the safety question, there is also the issue of who pays when things do go wrong. I think that companies in the car space are greatly worried about liability. And as long as the person is in charge, you can move the liability to the driver, which is commonly the case in the automotive industry. If you have the car completely self-driven, there's a big question who's going to be liable. For disability campaigners, there is no question that fully autonomous cars would transform their lives. Advocates for the blind and others who struggle to get around by themselves have been particularly vociferous in their support for allowing level four vehicles. In our society, though a lot more people are taking public transportation than ever before, driving is still the primary means of getting from place to place um, for people. And that has something that has been uh, elusive for a lot of people with disabilities. 
and technology is bringing that dream of freedom and choice and autonomy. As well as improving the lives of disabled people, the impact of autonomous cars on everyone in society could be huge. Not only may robots replace human workers in jobs such as trucking or taxis, but the very shape of our cities might be transformed. That's according to Jerry Kaplan, a tech entrepreneur who has been studying robotics and artificial intelligence. The benefits for society are going to be enormous. It will change things like where you can work and how you can live. And just think about reclaiming the space in your house that's currently used for a garage. There's estimates that 40% of the space in Los Angeles is designed around automobiles, where to park them, where to drive them, etc. We may only need 10% as many cars because they will be in much heavier use than they are today. While all this may sound futuristic, it is a matter that regulators around the world are actively considering right now. The technology for autonomous vehicles is here today. Now we just have to perfect it. The cars will be ready far before I believe the regulations will be in place. For Jesse Lorenz, that moment cannot come soon enough. In my own situation, I have a four-year-old little girl. I'm a single mom. She's in preschool. She'll start kindergarten this fall. And I would love to be able to get into my car and drive her to school, just like the other moms. You know, there's sort of a, a joke in our family, like, who's going to drive first? Uh, me or my four-year-old, and it's going to be me. It's going to be me. Companies such as Google and Toyota are solving many of the technological barriers to full autonomy. But next step is convincing regulators and the man in the street that these vehicles are not just roadworthy, but actually an improvement on human drivers. It was time to take our rock star robot to our VIP meeting room for some more intensive questioning but not before a quick visit to the canteen to pick up some provisions. Does someone need a hug?